I, George E. Pataki, do solemnly swear. I, George E. Pataki, do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of New York. And the Constitution of the State of New York. And that I will faithfully discharge. And that I will faithfully discharge. The duties of the office the duties of the office of governor of the state of New York of governor of the state of New York according to the best of my ability according to the best of my ability so help me God so help me God Thank you. Chief Judge Kay, Governor Cuomo, Governor Kerry, Mrs. Rockefeller, members of the legislature, elected officials, members of the judiciary and clergy, my friends and fellow New Yorkers, today it begins. Thank you. With your help, we are going to succeed. As I look around this hall today and see so many friends and supporters, people I've known for so many years, I have to begin by saying to each of you, Libby and I are more grateful than we can say for your help, your encouragement and friendship over the years. So thank you not only for being here today, but for so many of you, for being there for us long before today. Believe me, Libby and I feel that each of you is up here with us on this platform this afternoon. And that feeling will be a much needed source of strength and encouragement in the months and years ahead. The change of administration that we have just witnessed marks not just a transfer of political authority, but a renewal of the democratic sanction under which it occurs, a reaffirmation of our common belief in a system of government that is ultimately answerable solely to the people. It is also testimony to a political environment, a political experiment in self-rule and individual freedom that when it began in this nation and state more than two centuries ago, most of the world saw as audacious and foolhardy, but one whose enduring vigor and simple good sense is testified to by our presence here this afternoon. As part of this democratic tradition, we have also just completed an election campaign that saw differing political views aired and argued, sometimes dispassionately, sometimes not so dispassionately all across our state. This sort of temporary division and robust disagreement is as it should be in a democracy. But now that the election is concluded, we meet here today to say, as President Jefferson taught us to say long ago, that we are all Democrats and all Republicans, that today our only resolve is to put the public interest above that of any party or faction.
So as we meet in the spirit of unity, we pledge, as one people and one state, to put aside personal and political differences and get on speedily and vigorously with the people's business. In that spirit, let me again acknowledge gratefully the assistance of Governor Cuomo in preparing for this change of administration. The governor's three terms in office. The governor's three terms in office have earned him a rightful place in our history of our state and governor. Now after 12 years, I hope you will permit me again on behalf of all the people of New York to thank you and to thank Matilda for your devoted service. Now, in, in mentioning the people's business, I also think it fitting that to mention today the people's mood. There is impatience, frustration, even for many, anger. To those who see this as public attitude as disappointing or dangerous, I would point out that just such a mood was at the heart of the American experiment in self-government and personal liberty. Discontent with punitive taxation and the excessive bureaucracy of an oppressive government was exactly the emotion that put the spark to our own revolution and the democratic way of life it gave us. The battle which took place on a farm not far from here near Saratoga was the turning point in that revolution. And I would remind those who are disturbed by the people's current mood of the lesson from that battle, the lesson that much good can come from the people's determination to see that government remains their servant and not their master. I would also remind them that impatience and frustration can exist only where there are also large reserves of hope and optimism and an abiding faith in the possibility of a better future. And as everyone here knows, New Yorkers have an abundance of hope and optimism. Despite government's failures or burdens, we have not given up our belief in ourselves, our families, our communities, or in our great state of New York. We seek change precisely because we believe that under our democratic way of life, change can happen, change can work, change can restore and renew New York. The kind of change, the kind, The kind of change that can make this state of dreamers and doers, innovators and builders, the leading state in the union, the empire state once again. <laughs> to achieve that greatness, we must again understand that personal freedom and opportunity are founded on our willingness to accept individual responsibility for ourselves, and for the society we live in. I would also note that if today some of the people are angry, that anger is a generous and optimistic anger, one not directed at our fellow citizens or any group of our fellow citizens, but at a government that has lost touch with its people. Let us be clear then about the public mood. We the people believe we can build a criminal justice system that protects the law-abiding and takes repeat violent felons off our street. We, the people, believe we can create a school system that ends disorder in the classroom, cuts bureaucracy, and makes excellence in learning and teaching again the hallmark of New York schools. We, the people, believe we can rid ourselves of a system of burdensome taxation and oppressive regulation that makes it too hard for entrepreneurs and small business men and women to expand, innovate, and become the source of new jobs in our economy.
We, the people, believe we can encourage a business climate that will continue to make New York the home of commerce, finance, and industry, and a state where businesses, large or small, are anxious to locate, create jobs, and expand opportunity. We, the people, believe we can cut spending and taxes, restore incentives and initiative, and reform return freedom and responsibility to the individual. We, the people, believe we can restore pride and dignity to those in need of help by breaking the cycle of dependency and replacing welfare with workfare. And we, the people, believe we can make government serve not the special interests, but the public interest, not those in office, but those who place them in office. We the people know that we must launch a new era of individual liberty, responsibility, and opportunity by removing obstacles government has placed in the path of an energetic and creative people. And to launch that new era is why the people have placed us here today. Let us begin. Today then, as I begin my tasks as governor, I make a pledge that I hope will be heard in every home in New York. My pledge that on this day of inaugural festivities and New Year's celebrations, that your frustrations will not be forgotten that your problems will not be overlooked, that I understand that the crisis is real, a crisis not of the people's making, but of the government's. And I say, what those in government have done, those in government can undo. So, I say to the members of the legislature and my new administration as we begin together our work for a better New York, the people have turned to us for change and renewal. Let us get it right. The people seek change. Let us give them sweeping and fundamental change, change that is certain and immediate. We can reduce spending. We can reduce taxes and regulation. We can control crime. We can improve our schools. We can create workfare to replace welfare. Others have, and so can we. <laughs> President Clinton has already announced the privatization of some federal agencies. $24 billion in spending cuts, innovative housing vouchers, and top-to-bottom welfare reform. I applaud the efforts of the new Congress and the President to move in this direction. But I do not propose today that New York merely follow the example of others. New Yorkers who built the Erie Canal and the greatest city in the world shouldn't be waiting. We should be leading, and we will. Our goal is not simply to do better. Our goal is to make this state again first in new jobs and economic opportunity, first in safe streets and sound schools, first in the number of creative citizens and productive businesses it attracts. I want our children and grandchildren to have the opportunity to build their lives here and not elsewhere. Our goal, simply put, is New York as the best place to live, the best place to build a future, to find a job, create a career, and raise a family. New York's children belong in New York State. What New York has been for us, a source of economic opportunity and civic pride, we must make it again for those who follow. Let us renew, then, that same spirit of hope and optimism 
that led those scorned as so-called colonial rabble to begin a revolution against the greatest empire on earth and give the world the American dream. A renewal of the same courage and determination that led so many immigrant millions. My grandparents, Mario Cuomo's parents, the ancestors of all in this room to find here in New York State a doorway to hope and a threshold that in places like Ellis Island they could step across to gain for themselves and their children a share in the American dream. We have inherited so much that is good from those who against such great odds began this nation and state. From those immigrant millions who with little more than the clothes on their backs and a few possessions kept alive the promise of a better future. When we consider what they left us and the obstacles they faced, we cannot feel daunted or discouraged by the problems that confront us. With the same determination and courage and hope they showed in pursuing their dreams, we will pursue our own. We will fulfill our dreams as they fulfilled theirs by understanding that the creativity of the individual is the true source of economic and social progress, that the family is the nurturing ground of both personal development and a larger social harmony, a place where the individual learns and grows in respect for others and develops those vital habits of responsibility to God, country, and community. In recovering the revolutionary spirit of Saratoga and the faith and optimism of Ellis Island, let us also remember the immigrant millions in the American revolutionaries were successful not only because they were spirited, but because they were wise, because they were free and they accepted responsibility. The American founders understood that a prerequisite to order and freedom and public safety is effective but limited government. From bitter personal experience, they learned that government has a terrible appetite for more power, an appetite that as it burdens its citizens with more taxes and more bureaucracy can bring down nations and empires. They knew this tendency of government with sometimes the best of intentions to grow bigger and more powerful has always posed history's most serious obstacle to social progress and its greatest threat to personal freedom. When government accepts responsibility for people, then people no longer take responsibility for themselves. Individual responsibility and personal freedom are inevitably linked. Limited government, then, was not just a slogan for the American founders. It was the path to greatness and the beginning of political wisdom. Let us resolve now that in the months and weeks ahead, we will return to such wisdom. We will begin where the people want us to begin reducing the size and cost of government and getting rid of unnecessary and counterproductive programs. The people believe that government has become too big, too unwieldy, too distant, too arrogant, that every day government seems to grow, not to benefit the taxpayers or the people, but the bureaucrats, office holders, and the special interests. The people are right. Today, today, government is simply too large. There are now 73 volumes of government regulations in New York State, over 55,000 pages of regulations laid end to end. That's 12 miles of red tape enough to stretch from Albany to Schenectady and back again. This is wrong. This has to stop, and it will. The facts are these. Spending is too high. The regulatory burden on our people excessive. Our tax burden too heavy. Let me repeat 
what the people of this state already know. State government is too big and it spends too much money. It's simple. It's time for a change. Let us then cut government spending and cut it again, remembering always that by downsizing government, we can restore people's confidence in the future by expanding individual responsibility and individual freedom. This is the challenge of the 90s, the challenge we face as we prepare to enter the next century to preserve and protect personal freedom and to restore individual responsibility. And, that, and as we confront our state's fiscal crisis, let us remember a simple truth. More government means higher taxes and fewer jobs. Less government means lower taxes and more jobs. Some ask, to eliminate a $5 billion deficit, will we raise taxes or will we cut essential government services? To them, we say there's another way, a way to make government less expensive and more responsive. Countries like Canada and England and many states at home have shown it's possible to streamline government, improve services, and cut costs by privatization. I will move aggressively on this front. In this In this connection, let us also remember that government works best when it is kept close to the people, that problems are best solved by those levels of government closest to them. So just as I will fight to stop Washington from imposing unfunded mandates on the state, I will work with elected officials to reduce government's burden on the people at every level. Whether in Washington, Albany, or at the local level, government is too big and too inefficient. The answer lies not in the collective wisdom and pampered bureaucracy, but in the genius of the individual and the people as a whole. Unfunded state mandates must end. Too often, too often, too often faceless bureaucrats tell local government what it must do and when it must do it. This too must end. This governor believes, this governor believes in the power of the people to make decisions for themselves. In confronting the other grave problems before us, we also look to apply the wisdom of the past. Our founders believe that one area where government should be strong and effective was maintaining public order and public safety. They understood society's first obligation is to those citizens who obey the law and respect the rights of others, and they expect government to protect them from those who do not. To, to that end, I will be putting before the legislature measures to eliminate work release and abolish parole for violent felons. Violent felons belong in jail. Violent felons belong in jail, and with your support, that is where they are going to be. Let me also note, that when a society does not express its own horror at the crime of murder by enforcing the ultimate sanction against it, innocent lives are put at risk. Not out of a sense of vindictiveness then, but a sense of justice, and indeed a sense of compassion for those who otherwise might become victims of murder, I will ask the legislature to pass, and I will sign and enforce the death penalty. And let me say, and let me say, if one police officer's life is saved, 
if one less child is caught in a crossfire, if one fewer cab driver or shopkeeper is killed in a robbery, then the death penalty will have proven itself worthwhile. <laughs> Crime is a serious concern for all New Yorkers, but far too many New Yorkers are also faced the trap of a failed welfare system. Sadly, today, one in 11 New Yorkers is on welfare. The welfare system, though well-meaning, has failed. It's time for workfare. The welfare reforms, the, the welfare reforms I present will stress reductions in bureaucratic overhead, consolidation of programs, tighten restrictions, but especially learn fair and welfare, work fair, all of them based on the principle that helping those less fortunate is a solemn obligation but that one of the most valuable means of providing such help is to look on welfare, not as a way of life, but as a means of temporary assistance, a step towards the dignity of self-sufficiency. <laughs> welfare was created to be a safety net, a safety net that should act as a trampoline so that people bounce back to full and productive lives. Instead, that safety net has become a bureaucratic spider web, a web that entangles people and from which few ever escape. We intend to help them out of that web of dependency and back to lives that are rich in dignity and opportunity. In this effort to change not only welfare, but to bring real, certain, and swift change to government, I will seek the support of New Yorkers for measures that will give government more directly back to them in accountability and give them greater control over its activities. I will seek legislation that will put term limits on office holders and give the people the clear, unmistakable democratic voice that is theirs with the right of initiative and referendum. Let me also make another pledge. More than any other state, we have shown right here that people of different creeds, races, and ethnic backgrounds can live and work together, that all people are part of the American dream and responsible for its greatest moments as long as I am governor. And I ask all New Yorkers to join me in this. I will do all that I can to fight racism or religious prejudice wherever it occurs. In our New York, there is no place for bigotry or for intolerance. Let us move forward then, in all these areas, to reform government, to reduce its cost and size. But when we have achieved all this, let us also remember we are only at the beginning. I spoke a moment ago about the hopeful spirit and common sense wisdom of our past those who fought at Saratoga and those who came after them at Ellis Island were an optimistic and hopeful people because they were wise enough to know that the true greatness of any nation is not found in the apparatus of government or state power. It is found in the people and all their spontaneous social, economic, and spiritual associations in their families, churches, and synagogues, fraternal and neighborhood organizations, and all those mediating institutions that are the real source of economic, social, and cultural progress. That famous early visitor to America de Tocqueville noted that the genius of America lay not only in the spiritual fervor of its people, but also in a remarkable voluntary spirit that came with this religious faith. The capacity and willingness of Americans to form together to help each other, to combine spontaneously for the benefit of all. It should be clear that our goal is not just changing government, but a much broader transformation of our democratic life, a renewal of our public spirit. 
Our goal is to release all the native genius and the pent-up energy of a people and state that once gave the American Revolution its turning point. A state that provided the immigrant millions with a home for their dreams. A state that built an Erie Canal, an Empire State Building, a Wall Street, and a Lincoln Center. A state that from Buffalo to Brooklyn, from Plattsburgh to Peekskill, from Rochester to the Rockaways, made itself the center of every industrial, commercial, cultural, communications, and even sports revolution in America. With this clear understanding that the real strength of our nation and state are its people, I will seek the help of New Yorkers through their community and neighborhood organizations to renew the greatness of New York. As we reduce the role of government, I will ask each of us to take an interest in the quality of our schools and involve ourselves from our farms to our suburbs and cities in the safety and development of our communities and neighborhoods. New Yorkers aren't afraid of that challenge. Hardly a day goes by when one of us, somewhere, isn't doing something heroic. New York is a state of heroes, some famous, some not. Only a few short weeks ago, here in Albany, we saw a situation all too familiar to us from the evening news as a gunman entered the state university, took students as hostages, and threatened to kill them. When one student, Jason McEnany, felt the danger to his life and others was imminent, he rushed the gunman. He sustained wounds, but with the help of other students, overpowered him. I spoke with Jason recently, and I'm glad to see him looking so well today. Today, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to introduce to you Jason McEnany and thank him on behalf of the people of this state. And I'd also like to introduce to you four of the brave students who came to Jason's aid after he was wounded. Mike Connors, Kevin Iacobacci, Robert Romanino, and Dockery Simpson. They too are true New York heroes. So today, as we inaugurate change in government, reaffirm our commitment to personal freedom and individual responsibility, and renew our public spirit, I take up my duties as governor in a spirit of optimism, with enthusiasm and confidence that government reform and democratic transformation can be achieved. And to those who still doubt our capacity for such achievement, I would ask them to consider not only our distant, but our most recent past. Only a few short years ago, the cold and dark of the Cold War was everywhere. The world seemed fated to continue its terrible struggle between the superpowers. Which of us who lived through that era can forget those dangers, the setbacks and heartbreaks? Among the most vivid memories of my own boyhood is watching the faces of my grandparents in tears as they watched TV images of a heroic struggle for freedom in their native land crushed by Red Army troops and tanks on the streets of Budapest. All this now has changed. Today, millions around the world have a chance for freedom, prosperity, and peace. So we have seen in our own time what American leadership in this country's native hope and optimism can achieve for our own people, for all the world. In this American greatness and exceptionalism, those of us from this state have a special share. As visitors who, for, who gaze for the first time at the Statue of Liberty, tourists who see the lights of Broadway, or honeymooners who watch the falls at Niagara, as they know, there is a special pace, rhythm, and magic to our state. Look at the names of all those who came to greatness in New York. 
political figures like Al Smith, Fiorella LaGuardia, Teddy and Franklin Roosevelt, sports heroes like Babe Ruth, Mickey Mantle, and Jackie Robinson, great leaders from business, commerce, and the arts. There is a music to New York, a rich and varied music that set America to singing, a music that came from the people, from Irving Berlin to Louis Armstrong, Cole Porter, and George M. Cohan. That music is still ours. We need only to listen for it, to become part of its hopeful chorus. I love this state, its people and places for many reasons. I think of the bustle and excitement of New York City and the memorable years Libby and I lived there. I think of how our family has enjoyed, more than I can say, the natural beauty of places like Montauk or the time we spent upstate, or how much our children, Emily and Teddy and Allison and Owen, enjoy swimming near a covered bridge on the Battenkill River and walking the fields and the farms. But always in my own mind, I come back to the Hudson Valley, a place whose beauty A place whose beauty gave America schools of great writers and great painters. Proudly and humbly, I think, too, of a local mailman's son who grew up in that valley and found there in his hometown of Peekskill all that is rich and good in the American dream. So that in my mind, when I'm home, two things stand out. First, the goodness of the people. And second, the only word I can find to express my feelings, gratitude. As New Yorkers and Americans, we are all grateful for the opportunity we have had in our own lives and for those who gave it to us. I think sometimes about my four grandparents from Hungary, Ireland, and Italy, going through those gates and lines at Ellis Island I know that their deep religious faith and their own daring spirit sustained them. But still, I am sure that if Janos and Elizabeth Pataki, Agnes Lynch, or Matteo Lagana, they must have felt as Governor Cuomo's or Senator D'Amato's or Senator Moynihan's parents or grandparents must have felt their own fears about how they would do in this new land, in this new world. And I sometimes wonder, if as they filed through the lines of inspectors and health officials, what they would have said or felt, if some predictor of the future had been able to tell them that they would not only just make a home here in New York, but also find so much opportunity that one day their grandson would be governor of the state of New York. that they would find their grandson governor of a state that at the time must have seemed a foreign and perhaps forbidding place. You know, I think they might have believed it. I know my father is smiling today, and I only have to look down a few seats and see that my mother is smiling. with gratitude to the people of New York for the spirit of hope and daring they brought so many to the wor new world and made them change and renew it for the faith in God and the freedom he enjoins that they passed on to us, a faith that has only recently brought democracy and hope to millions of people around the world. Let us now turn to problems left too long unattended at home. And as we do so, let us remember that only when the personal success and liberty that is the American dream touches every life in every corner of our state can it ever truly be our own. So let us now go forth, get to work, and together restore New York to the greatness that is its destiny. God bless you.